right? For any problem at hand, to check whether a proposed solution is a valid solution to the input problem or not, all you need to do is to check that against necessary condition. But if you don't have any proposed conditions, but they're not necessary conditions, okay? So that's kind of really what you need to know. All right, that being said, let's move back to our lecture discussion. So to kind of wrap up the discussion on straight to face locking and non straight to face locking. So in straight to face locking, the way you understand this graph, I actually drew this graph on the whiteboard in the last lecture, right? But let me recap what this graph means. The y axis, the y axis stands for number of locks, number of locks of a particular transaction has held over its lifetime over its lifetime. And x axis is the lifetime of a single transaction. Lifetime of a single transaction. And what this graph is saying is for any transaction, for any, you may have millions of transactions in your system, but for any transaction, if you're using straight to face, sorry, if you're using straight to face locking, the graph will look like the graph on top, which is there's a log growing phase, meaning that transaction has started, you keep acquiring new logs. Henceforth, the number of logs that the transaction has held will be a monotone function, monotone, monotonic increasing function. Of course, the, while you are growing the logs, in between of acquiring any two logs, you may be doing stuff, right? Read object, write object, do some calculation. Yes, that may happen, but I don't care. As far as this graph is concerned, I'm looking at only the number of logs you have held. In between, you know, two uh, new logs you have acquired, a lot of things can happen. You can read an object, you can write an object. For those, you have the corresponding logs on, right? So I'm showing just the number of logs you have acquired so far. Then there's a stabilized phase, meaning that you, you are no longer acquiring any new logs. However, for straight to these locking, this, during this phase, you cannot release any log. You have to release all your logs at once at the time of commit. Things for that give you the graph on top. What about non straight toothed locking? Well, for non straight toothed locking, there is this log growing phase. This is log growing phase. Then there is the level of period, right? You are not acquiring any new logs. Then you realize, you realize this transaction realizes, oh, I, I no longer need any logs. So I can start releasing logs. I don't have to release them all at once. I can start to release logs. The order you release these logs depends on your business logic. Meaning that, for example, you're done with reading and writing object A, then you know you can release the log on A because you no longer need a log. Of course, you cannot release a log on B if you haven't finished what you want to do with object B. That's clear. Does that make sense? You may wonder, what if I am done with both object A and B, what should be the order of releasing log A and B? Well, that order can be arbitrary, because at that point, nobody cares. You are done with those logs, the order you release those two logs, nobody cares. You can do whatever order you like. Okay? But the point is, this curve, once you start decreasing, you cannot go up again. You cannot say, okay, I no longer need the object A, the lock on object A, I release that. Then I re realize I need a lock on object C, and I don't have that lock, so I will acquire a new lock for that, so the number lock will go up. That's not allowed, even in non straight to this lock. Once you start to go down, you have to keep going down. You may be level off for a period, meaning that you go down, then you level off, meaning that you release some logs, then you stop releasing logs. So you level off, then you start releasing logs again. That's possible. By the way, same thing here. The growing phase is not necessarily a steady curve like this. It can be like growing like this, then level off, then grow again. So I acquire some logs, I start doing stuff, which take time, then level off, then I grow in again. Growing the number of logs I have. Does that make sense? I hope everyone have a 
really good thorough understanding of these two graphs because they really these graphs are basically revealing of the relationship between straight and non straight to these markets. Okay? All right, so let's move forward. So far is, huh? Next, I'm gonna talk about uh, a new concept called conflict serializable schedule. And the definition is two schedules are conflict equivalent if, first of all, they involve the same actions of the same set of transactions, meaning they're talking about the same set of actions from the same set of transactions. That's requirement number one. Requirement number two, every pair of conflicting uh, actions is ordered the same way. What do I mean by that? To understand this definition, you really need to understand two things. One is, what do I mean by pair of conflicting actions? The second is, what do I mean by ordered the same way? If you understand those two, you understand this statement, right? So what do I mean by pair of conflicting actions? Well, we talk about three pairs of conflicting actions, which is RW, WR, and WW. Remember, we, when we talk about the anomalies, this is called read and write. Anomaly, this is write and read anomaly. For example, this basically leads to a dirty rate, and this leads to an unrepeatable rate. Right? We talk about, we went over these three anomalies, right? Of course, this means by two different transactions. So R by transaction one, W by transaction two. W by transaction one, R by transaction two. Of course, this also implies that transaction one, this is right, this has not been committed while you're performing the, the read off. Otherwise, it's fine. Otherwise, it's okay. So far, so good? These are all uncommitted transactions, uncommitted transactions. So this is what we call, this is what we mean by pair of conflicting actions, pair of conflicting actions, okay? That's, uh, that's how you understand that part. What do I mean by order the same way? Okay, let's assume, let's take this as an example. Let's say this is, let's realize, you know, let's make this a concrete example. Let's say I'm doing with one of opt A, then write one or up that A in schedule one. Schedule one, suppose that's what I do. Schedule two says, okay, I'm gonna do read one of A, then I'm gonna do something else. Let's say I'm gonna do write one of B, and here I'm gonna do read one of B, I'm gonna do write one of A. So here, what happens maybe is like, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna change this to write one of B and read one of B. You look at what happened here. If this is a pair of conflicting action of interest, you're looking at this is one pair of conflicting actions. R1 of A, oh sorry, this should be two. I'll guess for that. Now, in this schedule, read one of A happens ahead of write two of A. And same here, read one of A happened ahead of read two of A. So that's, mean, that's what we mean by order the same way. Who occur first? Who occur second? That's all we all want to know. In between, I don't care. Now, if we look at another pair of conflicting action, there's another pair of conflicting action. Now, they are ordered the same way as well in this example. They are ordered the same way as well. Right, one of B happened before V2 of B. Before that. So in this case, these two schedules satisfy what we call conflict equivalent. Because one thing they involve the same set of actions by the same set of transactions. Two transactions, each transaction has two actions. And every pair of conflicting actions, there are two pairs of conflicting actions we identify, both pairs order the same way. So this is called conflict equivalent. Conflict equivalent. You follow this? Are you good? Let me give you an example where the two schedules are not conflict equivalent. Very simple. 
Let's change this to Okay, now look at this. This pair of conflicting actions is ordered the same way. Read 1 of A happens before write 2 of A. But for the second pair of conflicting actions, they are ordered a different way. In this case, in schedule 2, write 1 of B happened ahead of read 2 of B, whereas here, read 2 of B happened ahead of write 1 of B. So this is not conflict equivalent. So this is an example that's not conflict equivalent. Okay? So it's actually a fairly straightforward definition once you understand what's going on. Now, once you understand what's conflict equivalent, you will be able to understand the next concept really easily. So we have serializable schedule, right? Serializable schedule says the input schedule is equivalent to one of the serial schedule. As long as you satisfy that condition, you are a serializable schedule. Conflict serializable schedule is a subset of serializable schedule. If I draw this out, this diagram, so this is all possible <coughs> schedules, meaning that you can interleave action from different transactions as much as one and any other. I don't really care. But this is Serial schedule, those you order transactions one by one, for example, like that. And then this is what we call serializable schedule, where we said, okay, basically for serializable, all you need to do is for a given schedule here, you need to find a schedule from the serial schedule that is equivalent to, right? That's what we said. What about conflict serializable schedule? Conflict serializable schedule is a subset of conflict serializable schedule. It's a subset of serializable schedule such that it's not only equivalent to a serial schedule, but it's conflict equivalent to a serial schedule. And you can prove this very easily. If you conflict equivalent to a serial schedule, you must be also equivalent to a serial schedule. This you can prove very easily. Okay, so that's the relationship of these three concepts. So far, good. Let me give you some further details on this. Let me give you an example. And this is a schedule that's not conflict serializable to a serial schedule. Why this is not conflict serializable? Let's look at this. Why this is not conflict serializable? If you look at this particular schedule, to check whether it is conflict serializable, or even to check if it's serializable schedule, you first have to find out what are the serial schedules. Can someone tell me what are the serial schedules in this case? How many serial schedules do you have in this case? Two. Yeah, what are they? T1, T2, T2, T1. Excellent. So there are only two serial schedules in this case, right? T1, then T2, or the T1. There are really no other choices you have. Okay? How do we check whether it's conflict equivalent to a serial schedule? Well, we look at whether every pair of conflicting actions are ordered the same way as if they are in a serial schedule. Let's check, right? Given this schedule, how many conflicting pairs do we have? How many conflicting pairs we have? First of all, we have that we have, we have a lot of conflicting pairs actually in this case. Right? For example, we have this W, and then we have so that's one conflicting pair of actions. Right? There is also that conflict with this. There's, that's another conflicting pair of actions. Similarly, for B, your, this same relation will hold for B as well. But it's flipped. The order of that is flipped. Do you notice that? For B, it's the opposite. It's the B 
means of this and You know, by making this observation, you can already figure out that this is not conflict equivalent to serial scanning. Why? Because for every pair of conflicting actions involving A, transaction 1 action happened ahead of transaction 2 action. But for, for every pair of conflicting actions involving B, Transaction 2 action happened ahead of transaction 1. There's no way you can make that equivalent to this or this. In this schedule, for every conflicting pair of actions, transaction 1 action will happen ahead of transaction 2, no matter whether it's A or B. For this, no matter whether it's A or B, for every pair of conflicting actions, transaction 2 action is going to happen ahead of transaction 1. Neither of this case will give you a scenario where conflicting action on A, one happened ahead of two, conflicting action on B, two happened ahead of one. There are no such thing in the two series scale. So you know for sure you're not going to have conflict equivalence of the two. You follow me? Yes? So far is it good? Now how do we formalize this? Fine, we can do this analysis, but imagine if I, I give you 10 transactions to draw this conflict equivalent schedule that's, to figure out whether it's conflict equivalent or not is really hard. So the way you do this, the way you do this is a hard. The way you do this is to use something called dependency graph. Dependency graph. In this dependency graph, every transaction becomes a node. So you, you look at, you have two transactions. Okay, T1, T2. That's the two nodes you have. Okay? You start with basically two nodes. Now, for every pair of conflicting actions you have identified, for every pair of conflicting actions you have identified, you draw an edge from the leading transaction to the succeeding transaction. For example, for this pair of conflicting actions, what's the leading transaction? Transaction 1 is the leading transaction. Transaction 2 is the succeeding transaction. So you draw an edge from T1 to T2, and on top of the edge, you indicate what is the object involved in that pair of conflicting actions. What about this? Well, it's going to be another edge on the same object, so it will just reinforce this, so it's not going to change the graph. Do you follow this? Yeah? Now, what about these two pairs? Let's look at this first. This will draw an edge, because in this case, transaction 2 is the leading transaction. Transaction 1 will be the succeeding transaction, because transaction 2 actually happened first, Transaction one ha action happens afterwards for that pair of conflicting actions. So I will draw an edge coming back with value of B <coughs> on top of it. And what about this pair? Well, that pair will result in the same edge and same object. So it will not change your graph. So far, so good? So this graph is fairly easy to construct, as you can tell. Now, the final statement. How do you tell if a, trans if a, if a schedule is conflict serializable? Very simple. This graph must be an acyclic graph in order for the schedule to be conflict serializable. Acyclic means there's no cycle in it. So, by the way, this is a directed graph. Directed graph means edge has directions. Give you a real, real, real world example of directed graph. If, you own, if we have no one-way street, if all the, road, all the streets in our road network are two-way streets, then literally you can model that as an undirected graph. Because each edge can go both ways. However, in, unfortunately, the, the road network in our life is not always two-way street. You have one-way street. So in order to model the road network, we have to use a directed graph. Sometimes you can only go from A to B, but not from B to A. Okay, so in this case, we're using a directed graph, and that directed graph must have a cycle 
following the direction. For example, this book, imagine if I change this to this. That's even though it looks like there's a cycle, but it's not a cycle. You follow me? Because we are talking about cycle in the direct graph sense. But this will be a cycle because cycle means that going from one point, there's one path that goes through the graph and come back to it. Question? Um, if we had um, three transactions and one of them would have been directed but the other... So cycle anywhere. You don't have to have a cycle involving all transactions. Okay. Cycle anywhere. Cycle for any subgraph of your graph. Excellent question. Can you just rephrase what does a cycle mean in respect to uh, conflict equivalence? So if you have a cycle like this, then you cannot be a conflict survival, conflict survival schedule. In other words, this is both a necessary and sufficient condition to check whether a given schedule is conflict equivalent to a serial schedule or not. It's both a necessary and a sufficient condition. What's over there? If we're just drawing these graphs to find cycles, if there was another dependency between T1 and T2 on B, would it be necessary to draw the arrow? You can draw that, yes, but but once you, as soon as you identify a cycle, you, you can stop drawing. Let's imagine there's another dependency on C, like this. So you basically identify two cycles, but as soon as you identify one cycle, you know for sure this is not a conflict surrounding this guy. So if you were to ask but if you don't have, but you haven't identified a cycle yet, you have to keep drawing. For example, it may be that for A it's like this, so it's no cycle, but once you add the edge on C, you form a cycle. I guess I'm just, like I believe you, but I just, I'm having a hard time understanding why a cycle, like why it is that a cycle means it's Oh, oh is if you understand this example I just said, you will understand why cycle is the troublemaker here. The, the cycle basically means that once you have a cycle, you mean it basically means that in a serial schedule, if you look at, let's go back to the basic. In a serial schedule, this edge means that T1 action on A must be ahead of T2 the action on B on A. However, you have a conflicting information where the action on B with this edge means that T2 the action must be ahead of T1. So there's no way you can do that in a serial schedule. That's how you make it. But I want to generalize your question, which is fun, interesting exercise, but why we care? Who care about conflicts around you? Right? Why you care about it? So this is interesting. Like if you if somebody who is not interested in football at all, you bring him or her to Super Bowl, you, you pay two thousand dollars for the ticket. Or maybe even I don't know, even more than that. At the end of the game, the person said, Okay, interesting. What was for? Why you're doing? Why you're bringing me here? Right, what's for? Right, what's for is this. Going back to the earlier comment I said, right? Straight token locking finds a subset of survival studies. What are that subset? That subset is conflict survival studies. Straight token locking is finding those conflict survival studies, not all survival. That's why we want to understand conflict survival scale. So straight to free locking is finding this guy. Essentially. It's actually easy to understand. Why straight to free locking is finding this guy? Because if you're using straight to free locking and you have a lock on this, the second edge will be blocked when you when the second conflicting pair come into picture, straight to free locking will make sure that's blocked. So that second edge will be prevented from forming in the first place. This requires a little bit of thinking. Uh, I don't want to go into detail because that requires some proof. But that's kind of the reason why street with locking is finding those acyclic graphs from this conflict survival graphs. That's because if I have this edge, if this is a conflicting action, transaction one must have an exclusive lock on A. Now, when you have this act, transaction two will try to acquire an exclusive lock on B, right? But because it's conflict, this, I, I haven't released this yet. So this action on, whatever action transaction two try to do on A will be blocked. So you cannot even start 
doing your action on B yet. That's how straight to law can prevent these cycles from forming in the first place. Following that argument, you can see why straight to fifth locking is really just finding conflict through radical schedules. But conflict through radical schedules is just a subset of all through radical schedules. That's why straight to fifth locking is only a sufficient condition, but not a necessary condition. Okay? So this is called the dependency graph. And dependency graph is really useful for identifying conflict serialized with scatters. Okay? Uh, so, the, so we stop right here. That's all you need to know for your final test. This is the last slide you need to go as far as final test is concerned. I want to continue on discussing log management a little bit, even though it's not part of your homework five, but I want to cover that a little bit, just like a FYI. Then I will move on to indexing management. Uh, just about your dependency graph. Yes. Uh, is it read T1 depends on T2 for A? Oh, no. Uh, T2 depends on it. Uh, it's, okay. I, I don't want to use the word. Well, it's really T2. The way you understand this is if the edge is this way, you should read this as the preceding of T2, meaning the execution of it. In order for T2 to proceed, it depends on when T1 will release a lock on A. Okay. That's the way you, you should do this. Right? Let me repeat. Right? The proceed of T2 will depend on when T1 will release the lock on A. Okay. Things for different lock management protocol will have different impact in this dependency graph. For straight to his locking, basically what this means is T2 cannot proceed until T1 commits. But for straight, for non straight to his locking, this basically means T2 cannot proceed until T1 start releasing locks. But when T1 start releasing locks, that also means T1 cannot acquire any new locks. So you, you need to understand this graph hand in hand with what locking protocol you're in. But assuming you are not using any locking protocol, you are looking at the schedule as is. This is the schedule as is. I'm not using any locking protocol. This is the schedule as is. Then you can construct this graph as is. And the useful use of that is if you construct the dependency graph as is to the input schedule, you can tell right away whether it's conflict survivable or not. If this is if it's not conflict survivable, what that tells you is even without running the locking protocol, you know for sure this schedule is not allowed as is in straight to this locking. Right? Question over there? Does the graph help you identify serializable schedules or like the isolation? A, I, I, very good question. It, it help you identify a subset of serializable schedules, but not all serializable schedules. Meaning that it is possible to have a serial schedule, serializable schedule, where the dependency graph has a direct cycle, yet it is still a serialized schedule. I'm not going to show you that tricky case, but it's possible. That's why it's it's a it's a subset of serialized schedule, but it doesn't cover all serialized schedule. Okay, fantastic. I think that's all I want to say. Now, for log management, I really want to talk about two things. One is really really just one thing, and there are many different topics, but I really want to cover one thing, which is. Uh, this concept of deadlock. You know, with locking, one tricky thing that may happen is you may have deadlock. Okay, when does this occur? So, for example, if you ever, how, how many of you, how many of you bought a second-hand car, car, a used car, you bought from a person, right? <laughs> I bought a second-hand car when I was a grad student. Now, back then, I was broke, right? So. No brainer, go with a clunky car. Right? And, but too bad I didn't catch that cash for clunky deal, the boost handout. That's not bad. But anyway, <laughs> so I paid for a clunky car. But even though it's a clunky car, I still had to pay for it. So I met this guy, and we met somewhere, and we reached a deal. So far, so good. 
The problem is, okay, he said, okay, you give me cash first. Now I give you, I drive my car to your yard, to my apartment. Back then I don't have a house. Then I said, no, 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 you drive your car to my yard, you give you the key, I do some tasks, then I give you cash. You see what's going on? That lock. <laughs> so he has the lock on car, I have the lock on cash, nobody willing to release first, and each one is waiting for the other guy to release the lock to proceed that lock. That's a perfect example of that. You see what I'm saying? That's a perfect example of that. So I'm not going to bother you with the detail how we fix that dialogue situation in real life, but I want to tell you how we fix that log in databases. Okay? So two ways of dealing with dialog. One is called dialog prevention. The other is called dialog detection. These are two different approaches from a philosophy point of view. So from a philosophy point of view, dialog prevention says dialog is so bad. Let's make sure they don't even occur in the first place. The second view says, that lock is bad, but it's not so bad. Let them occur. And we deal with, that, deal with them on the fly, if they do occur. These are two different mentalities, if you think about it. Totally two different mentalities. So let's look at how we do that. That lock prevention. OK, we basically assign priorities based on timestamps. And assuming TI wants to uh, want a lock that TJ holds, and two policies are really possible, two policies are possible. One is called wait and die, and the other is won't and wait. Wait and die says if TI has higher priority, TI waits for TJ, otherwise TI awards. Priority is assigned based on the star timestamp of a transaction. The smaller that timestamp is, the higher priority you have. Meaning you give whoever start earlier a higher part. So if TI wants a lock currently held by TJ, and TI starts before TJ, then TI can wait for that lock. Otherwise, if you are requesting a lock that TJ holds, and TI starts after TJ has started, then TI cannot even wait for the lock. TI will report right away. You follow this? This will make sure you have no deadlock from forming in your system. And will then wait is even more aggressive. It says, if TI has higher priority and I need a lock you currently has, I don't even want to wait for you. I keep you out. I grab the lock. You follow what I'm saying? Right? So this is one that way. So when a transaction is aborted and wait starts, you want to make sure the priority of that transaction is assigned based on its original timestamp rather than, rather than based on the timestamp of the time that it wait starts. Why is that? Can someone tell me that? But it'll eventually get through. It will eventually get through. This is called preventing transaction from starving. Preventing starvation. If you if you don't do this, you allow you basically ask a transaction to get a new timestamp every time it's being forced to abort. It will always be a lower priority transaction in your system, and it will be it's possible that it will be aborted all the time. But if you abort a transaction because a higher priority kicks in, and you allow this transaction to inherit its original timestamp. Yes, currently I'm a lower priority, but eventually I will be of the highest priority. Because all the transactions now start after my original timestamp. Okay, so that's kind of called dead log prevention. Okay? So dead log detect it, so you can you can easily show that if you run that protocol, you will end up with no dead log at all. However, dead log prevention is expensive. Why is it expensive? Because you may end up aborting a lot of transactions no matter what. Imagine my schedule looks like this. And T1, let's say T1 has higher priority. So I need, you know, this conflicting action that have, uh, occurs ahead of, and I have another thing like this. So this will, you know, let's say, at the time T1 tries to execute this action on A, 
T2 uh, you know, holds this, you know, let's say I want to do this. So T2, this basically means this action had happened ahead of R1, R1 on B. And but let's say T1 has a higher priority, what happened is this will be in one time, let's say you, you use this uh, dialog prevention scheme called one time wait, what happens is T2 will simply be forced to abort. So that this exclusive lock on B is released right away, so I can proceed. You follow this? But this can be super expensive if you have a lot of conflicting action between different transactions in your system. You end up aborting each other all the time. You can, you can see that scenario, right? So another strategy is to say, okay, you know, dialogue is bad, but it's rare to occur. Let the let system run as it is. Like Amazon.com says, okay, two users are gonna do a trade and they're gonna enter a dialogue. But that doesn't happen all the time. So let the system be, let the system be. And if bad case happens, bring them to the court and we make a judgment. Instead of saying, we hire a million of police force so that crime never occur. That's kind of the two philosophy, right? The first philosophy, dialogue prevention, is that how do we prevent crimes? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna have a million police officers. That's not enough, three million police officers. Still not enough, 10 million police officers. Of course, there's a problem with that strategy, which is you have to assume police officer is good which is not always the case, right? But let's assume that something is true. Then just adding more police officers will prevent all the crimes. That's kind of like dead law prevention. Dead law detection says, okay, I cannot afford to run so many police officers. That's too expensive. So let crime happen. And when it happens, bring them to a court of law, then I will deem some pun punishment, then it's fine. So that's kind of what we're gonna talk about next, okay? So dead law detection. In this case, we're gonna create what we call a wait for graph. Notice, okay, this, is, this actually is very similar to the conflict graph we just talked about. Very similar, but different things. Again, okay, each node is a transaction. Now the edge from TI to TJ, if TI is waiting for TJ to release a law. So you don't abort any transaction. You just document the fact that a transaction is waiting for the release of a log held by another transaction. You simply document all these facts. This is called the wait for graph. And periodically you check if the wait for graph has a cycle or not. If it has a cycle, that indicates a dead log has formed. You have to do something about it. So here I have two examples. This graph represents all the way to this point. Uh, this graph represents adding that transaction uh, exclusive log on A. Now you have a now you have a cycle, uh, this form a dialog. This form a dialog. And what do you do after you have detected a dialog? That's up to you. You can choose to abort any one of these. But the thing is, with dialog detection, you can selectively abort which transaction that you want to abort, rather than blindly abort those transactions with lower priority. So you have more choice. But the trade-off, there's no free lunch. What's the trade-off? The trade-off is, first of all, you need to maintain this graph, and you need to run this detection of cycles over this graph all the time. It looks like a simple task, but in real system, imagine you have millions of transactions we're talking about a graph with a million of nodes, and you're trying to detect cycles from the graph. That's not an easy task. That's not an easy task. And remember, the, these are two subtle problems, but it, it makes a huge difference. One problem is, tell me whether the graph has a cycle or not. The other problem is, not only tell me whether the graph has a cycle or not, if it has a cycle, show me where the cycle is. The second problem is way harder than the first problem. But for that all detection, you need to solve that second problem. Not only need to tell whether there is a graph or not, you need to find exactly where that graph locates at in your graph. 
Why? Because you need to do something. Right? You need to address that. You need to abort some of those nodes involving in that graph. So you, involving in that cycle. So you need to find where the cycle is. Okay? So that's that of prevention and that of detection. Do I have another question? So uh, I'm unclear on what you mean by abort. Abort means, okay, when this happens, you choose one of these and force that to abort. Once you abort, you release all the locks so that the cycle no longer exists. So does T2 have to then be run again? Suppose, you, yeah, T2 will restart. Okay, yeah. So this is, I guess, just like from my implementation, maybe you don't want to get into it, but like when, when you're locking or whatever, are you locking like over a single record ah. row in a table, <laughs> an entire table? Okay, uh, I, I have slides for that, but I don't uh, want to cover that. It's called the granularity of your lock. Uh, that's a which subject I will not cover. Okay. Yes. Okay. In fact, there's also something called latch. Uh, it's a lightweight lock. So latch, in real life, you know what latch is, right? If you have a, if you have a house and you have a backyard, and if, and, and a lot of it, right? And if your backyard has a door, like a wooden frame door, oftentimes you just apply a latch with a lock on it. That makes sense? So it's a lightweight lock. Because locking creates a lot of overhead in your system. And of course, there is also the problem you were asking, which is the granularity of the lock. Are you locking a single record, a, a single column, a set of records, or a, col or a full table, or log the entire database? So those are the things we just don't have time to cover that. Um, we have detailed discussion on that in the grad level data class, okay? All right, that's all I need to talk about, I, I want to talk about, about transactions. Uh, for the final test is concerned, you don't need to understand the dialogue prevention and dialogue detection, but you do need to understand what a dialogue is. You need to understand what a dialogue is. But you don't need to understand dialogue detection and dialogue prevention. Detail of those, but you need to understand what a dialogue is. In the very least. Okay? All right. Uh, so let me move on to the next subject. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the internal of the database systems. Using the remaining 15, 20 minutes each I have here. Then, uh, next, uh, on Wednesday lecture, we'll talk about no SQL system. In particular, I'm going to use this MongoDB as an example uh, to kind of tell you what MongoDB is and how that connects with relational database. The fact is, the simple fact is the following once you know inside out the relational database engines, it's super easy to learn any no SQL system. It's kind of like what you did in phase two, which is you have no experience in Java, but you know how to do object oriented programming. And if you have that knowledge to do Java, you can do that in two days. And it's that simple. If you know a relational database system inside out, the foundation of it, you know, how it works and all that, migrate that knowledge to uh, a, a no SQL system is super straightforward. For the most part. Of course, there are always those corner cases, those technical details that require time and experience to understand, but for the, for the bulk of it, it's fairly easy to migrate your knowledge from relational database to, uh, to manage a no SQL system and get it up and running. It's super, uh, that translation is super smooth, actually, as you will see on Wednesday when I talk about MongoDB. And that means that let's talk a little bit about storage engine buffer and files, because this is kind of important for you to understand the connection between relational database system to a no SQL system and to understand the difference between structured data and unstructured data. Okay? So I will go fairly quickly for one for two reasons. One, this is not covered for your final test, so you don't have to worry if you want to say. Second, we really want short of time. So I will go super fast. Okay? So bear with me on this. I'll skip a lot of things. So here is a quick overview of computer architecture. 
like really simplified view of what's running on your computer. There's a CPU, and then attached to your CPU, there is something called cache. And you can further classify them into data cache and instruction cache. Okay? Then you have your memory, your RAM. Uh, beyond that, you have your secondary storage. Typically, it's your hard drive or your solid state drive. What's critical is both cache and memory are volatile, meaning that if you lose power or your system crash, those data are lost forever. Your secondary storage media, your hard drive, your solid state drive are permanent, are durable, meaning that if system crash or you lose power, data stored in those storage media is gonna sustain the crash. Okay, that's a key difference. <coughs> Performance-wise, cache is fastest to access data from, typically in the order of nanoseconds. Cache is the second fastest, uh, typically in the order of uh, a tenth of millisecond or something like that. And disk is the slowest, hard drive is the slowest, typically in the order of maybe not one millisecond, but like one something millisecond or close to one millisecond. In talking about, I'm talking about accessing a page of data, a page of data. A page of data is a logic unit of some consecutive number of bytes in your system. Okay? So that's kind of the way you understand this graph. So, so there is this, you know, summarized by, by this picture here. Right? And the arrows here representing what we call data transfer. In order for your CPU to operate, you need to bring data all the way from hard drive or solid state drive to memory, then to cache. CPU can only operate over data in cache, not on your memory or your hard drive directly. So this involves expensive data transfer. Why? Because the capacity of your cache is very small, typically in the order of in the old days, it's in the order of kilobytes, now maybe in the megabytes, but it's very small, the capacity of your cache. So you cannot imagine to hold all your data in cache. Most of the data are going to be in memory, the vast majority of the data are going to be on disk. Okay? So this is a recurring theme in system, right? System, computer system is all about the following, which is safe and reliable management of limited resources. It's all about limited resources. Imagine if your cache is unlimited size, then all these problems go away. You have to store everything in cache. CPU can directly operate over. But unfortunately, our technology just cannot do that. Why? Because CPU is a physical unit, like this big, right? and maybe this big. And there are millions of millions of transistors in it. Each of, each of the transistor is super small, but still takes some physical space. You can only pack these many transistors in the CPU. Uh, henceforth, it limits how much data, or how big your cache is. That's just physical constraint you cannot bypass. You follow me? All right, so that's kind of the picture we're looking at. And I'm gonna skip the RAM model. The level one level to catch, I'm gonna skip all of this. I wanna talk about disk, the hard drive, because that's still the most common player for you to store data. And that's, you know, for the most part, where your database store your data. So the way you understand disk or hard drive is the following. Disk consists of multiple, uh, what we call platters. And each platter has a surface, that's, that's a magnetic surface. Using this magnetic surface, the you know, computer store zero or one bit. Why? Because magnetic surface in a magnetic field has two polarizing directions, north and south. And using that, you can represent zero or one. And why this is durable is because magnetic field doesn't rely on external power to uh, store this you know, polarizing information. North and South, you don't need external power to sustain that information. Okay? You follow me? That's why hard drive is able to store data permanently. Okay? You use one of the direction to represent one, you use the other direction to represent the value of zero. That's all you need. Okay? 
So this is that magnetic surface, and you, you organize this magnetic surface into some logical unit called track. Okay, called track. And each of this small line segment represents a sector. A sector typically is 512 bytes. 512 bytes. Okay, which means it's about 4,000 bits. Good morning. Consecutive bits on your disk. Four, about 4,000 bits. That's one sector. And a consecutive set of sectors form a logical unit called page. That depends on how many sectors involving a page, that depends on your page size. Suppose typically a database page size is 4 kilobytes. If each sector is 500 bytes, 512 bytes, a 4 kilobytes page will be A sector. A consecutive sectors form a page. What about the concept of track? All the sectors with the same radius to the center of your disk will be a track, will be a track. So this is one track, this will be another track, another track, another track, another track, until you run out of the surface of your magnetic disk. Okay, this is one platform. So how do I read data from my disk? How do I read data from my disk? This is that you know, red spindle in this graph is for, right? So there is this arm, it's called this arm. This guy is able to convert magnetic field to electron signals. For example, north is being transferred to a posit positively charged electron. And south will be converted to a negatively charged electron. That's how you convert zero and one to, from this to zero and one in your memory. You follow that? That's a physical process of what's happening on that arm. That's how the conversion works. Now, what happens is the head of this arm needs to be placed on top of the bytes you are trying to read. Okay? What if the bytes I'm trying to read is here, my arm is here? Well, you need to move your arm in and out and also rotate your disk so that the byte you are trying to raise will be eventually rotated right under the head of your arm. Okay? You follow this? So I'm pointing at this particular track, but the data I'm trying to read is from this track. So what I have to do first is move my arm to the inner track, then wait for the track to rotate until the bytes I'm trying to read will be rotated right under the head of my arm. That's how a disk works. I have an animation for this. Suppose that's the data you have, you're trying to read. So you're going to move this first to this track, then wait for this track to rotate. Speaking of which, when you buy a hard drive on Amazon or anywhere, you always notice this something like this. Do any one of you, does any one of you know what this means? For example, you go to You look at any of this hard drive. It's, on the, it's in the title. It's in the title? Uh -huh. Ah, so it's so important they put it in the title. Right? So you, you always, always wonder what this means, right? 60 bits per second, 720 RPM, all the, what does it mean? I don't, I don't want to go into detail of all the spec, right? but let's focus on the RPM. So now understanding how, you know, I just explained to you how hardware works, right? Why this RPM value is so important? Because that, de that, that determines how fast your disk can rotate. If you don't know what RPM is, you, you, most of you drive a car, right? Look at your engine dashboard. There's an RPM there as well, right? No? You know this? Most of you look at, there are two, dash, two dashboards uh, meters. One is the one you look at all the time, which is miles per hour. I hope you pay attention to that. <laughs> if you don't, then one day you get a ticket, you will start paying attention. That's how I start paying attention. By the way. <laughs> Before my first speeding ticket, I really don't care about that. Okay. And it has to be a big speeding ticket for me to start paying attention to that. 15 bucks, I don't care. Okay. 
So there's one meter like that. But there's another meter next to it. Do you guys pay attention to it at all? If you're really into car racing stuff, right? You, you, you want to pay attention to that. That's RPM. Like how much power your engine is pushing out, essentially. Right? So rotation per minute, that's what it stands for. In the context of this, what that means is, this RPM basically means, once you bring this, 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 this arm to the right track, suppose the data you are trying to read is here, you cannot read this data yet. You have to wait for this to rotate right under the head of the arm. How fast you this can rotate determine how fast you can read data from this, obviously. So that's why RPM is really important. So that's how hard drive works. So understand, once you understand this, now you understand transferring data from this to memory is expensive. Why? Because, you know, in order to read data, you have to go to a particular, you have to move your arm to a particular location and wait for the disk to rotate. Both of these are mechanical movement. Mechanical movement are slow. Especially if you compare that against how you transfer data in mid memory, in cache. In memory, in mid memory and cache, data are represented as electron signals. You know how fast electrons travel in the physical world? How fast do they travel? You know that? Not close to, near the speed of light. Not as fast as the speed of light, but almost as fast as the speed of light. Almost as fast as the speed of light. As far as we know, to this date, the speed of light is the fastest speed you can achieve in the physical world. Nobody can break that barrier. How fast you can tra travel. Okay? So, Data in main memory and cache are transferred really, really fast for that reason. But now you're talking about mechanical movement. No matter how fast you can move, I, I, I'm not aware any mechanical object that human being has made today can travel not near the speed of light. Right? If, you, if you can do that, I mean, that's like breaking news right away. Right? You wear the t-shirt of NASA, that's all they do. You cannot, you cannot do that. It's like mechanical speed is super slow compared to the speed of light. That's why transferring data from things to memory is expensive. This brings up the second topic I want to talk about, which is how do you address this issue? Well, you are trying to be smart in what data you want to transfer from things to memory. You don't want to transfer all the data from things to memory all the time. You want to predict what data is needed so that you can prefetch them to disk and cache uh, from disk to memory and cache them in your memory somehow. That brings up the next topic, buffer. But before I talk about buffer, I want to talk about using the remaining time of today's lecture, I want to talk about another storage media that most of you are using nowadays called solid state drive. You may wonder what's the difference between solid state drive or flash disk versus or magnetic disk, hard drive. Big difference, okay? Big difference. For the following reasons. One thing is you, not, you need to understand what's sequential access versus random access on hardware. If you understand what I said so far, to read some bytes, you have to move the arm, wait for the rotation. If you want to read another byte, you have to move the arm again, wait for the rotation. That's if you do random access. If you want to, if, if what you want to read is consecutively located on disk, around this track, Suppose it's all around one track. All you need to do is move arm once, and you don't have to do anything. You wait for the arm to wait for the disk to rotate. You continue reading data from that. That's what if you are doing sequential access. That's why, okay. That's why on a hard drive, sequential access is much cheaper than doing random access. For that reason. For that reason. That's why Windows used to have this function called disk. Defragmentation. This defragmentation, it does a lot of things, but in high level, what it does is for data concerning the same application or same document, instead of spreading them all over different places on your hard drive, de defragment them, put them into same track or close by tracks if possible. So that when you're reading them, you end up doing sequential access than random access. That saves you access time by an order of 10, at least. 
You follow that? Okay, that's hard drive. What about solid state drive? Okay, I'll overrun one minute, okay? Solid state drive is permanent, meaning that it's, it, it sustains system failures, and I don't need external power to store data. You use a different physics. It doesn't use magnetic field to store zero and one. It uses a different technology, which I'm not going to go into detail. But the important thing to note is, in solid state drive, sequential access is Random access is as cheap as sequential access. That's a big win for solid state drive, right there. Second, both sequential access and random access are cheaper, are more efficient than hard drive. That's second observation. Third observation, there's no free lunch, right? What's so bad about solid state drive? It's expensive. Solid state drive is expensive when it comes to write. It's super expensive when it comes to write. So don't try to write your data to your solid state drive all the time. But one thing is very expensive in terms of timing it takes. Second plane, it reduces the lifetime of your solid state drive. Why? Solid state drive store data as block as well. But in order to change even just one byte in a block, you cannot do in-place update. What you have to do is copy this whole block to a special region called eroder block. Erase the whole block and write the updated content of that block back into that, that page and then move it back. This process is super expensive as you can tell. And the physics behind the storage of storage uh, solid state drive make it that if you if you erase a block all the time, its, cap it's capability of storing data actually will go down. One day it will just break. So don't try to do a lot of, especially random writes, Sequential write, the first time a block is being written is fine. You can write the whole block to it. But once a block starts holding data, even to change one byte, you need to do that expensive reader block process. So try not to do a lot of random writes to your solid state drive. It will definitely reduce the lifetime of your solid state drive for a significant portion of it. That means I'll continue on Wednesday, OK? Every time, every, the more I learned that like,